Now, any day now, we're told the Prime Minister will announce a new list of appointments to the House of Lords, and most of them will be Conservative. In these post-coalition days, the Conservative government sits alone in the Upper House and is heavily outnumbered. Since the general election in May, the Conservatives have been defeated ten times in the Lords, and when Parliament returns next month, many more defeats are expected. But the Conservatives are crying foul. Under the 1945 Salisbury Convention, they argue, peers are constrained from wrecking an elected government's programme. And if you were just asking yourself, what is the Salisbury Convention? Here's our reporter Gary Connor to explain. The King in the uniform of the Admiral of the Fleet, the Queen in blue. The whole procession, two to three hundred yards long, goes driving steadily by. And the great surge of cheering goes with it as it passes down now towards the Victoria Tower and the royal entrance to the House of Lords, where a large party is waiting to greet His Majesty as he arrives there. Richard Dimbleby there at the state opening of Parliament in 1945. Clement Attlee's party had swept to power in the general election of that year with a massive Commons majority. But without a majority in the House of Lords, any government, however big its popular vote, will struggle to pass legislation. And after the 1945 election, the Conservatives dominated the red benches, with some 400 peers compared to fewer than 20 Labour members. So a solution had to be found to stop the legislative process grinding to a halt. The longest serving member of the House of Lords is the 96-year-old Conservative Lord Carrington, who took his seat in 1945. He witnessed the problem the House was confronted with firsthand and told me all about it in one of the Lords' tea rooms. Nobody quite knew what to do, but Lord Salisbury at the time, who was the leader of the opposition, um, very sensibly decided that uh, the, the, the enormous Labour majority in the House of Commons and the House of Lords had to recognise that uh, as an unelected chamber it shouldn't get in the way of what the Labour Party had been elected to do. And um, he, together with the Labour leader, who was Lord Addison, who was also a very sensible man, decided they ought to find some way of stopping the enormous majority of Conservative peers from wrecking the Labour Party government's programme. And they came up with the Salisbury Convention. This was an understanding that Conservative peers would not vote against Labour manifesto pledges at second or third reading but that legislation could still be amended, just not thrown out completely. At uh, 12.36 on Friday the 8th of May, we can say that this is now officially a Conservative victory. Last time the Conservatives were in government on their own, they had an inbuilt Lords majority, thanks to a vast number of hereditary peers, but most were removed in 1999. Now Labour, the Lib Dems and crossbenchers combined outnumber the government. So do those on the opposition benches sense an opportunity? Any government has to accept it's going to be scrutinised. Baroness Smith of Basildon is the Labour leader of the opposition in the Lords. The second reading of a bill where the government lays out its principles, we would rarely, hardly ever, vote against that part of the bill. Our job is to get down to looking at the nitty gritty. But we're not trying to wreck the government's legislation. We accept they've got you know, a, a mandate. But what we do have to do is look at the details. Well, I would say the Salisbury Convention was something that was probably quite properly drawn up in a very different time. Lord Wallace of Tankerness is the Lib Dem leader in the House of Lords. My predecessor as leader of the Lib Dem peers, uh, Lord McNally, um, made it very clear ten years ago uh, that we didn't necessarily accept the Salisbury Convention. I think that remains our position, that um, we didn't sign up to it. But it doesn't mean to say we're going to act irresponsibly. And as I've said, the position we take is that we must, in the ultimate analysis, retain the right to say no as a House of Lords. What's an exceptional circumstance for you? I mean, it's always very tempting to, to, to hypothesise, and I think it's one of these things that you know it when you see it. What I will say is that it would be a, s a situation where ill-thought-out legislation, that, that's, you know, that there's a bit of a dog's breakfast, or, or legislation that was going to seriously trammel on the, the rights, the human rights of, of citizens, I think these are the kind of occasions we would want to give very, very close scrutiny. All governments lose votes in the House of Lords. Baroness Stoll of Beeston is the Conservative leader of the House of Lords. It would be surprising if any government in this House were not defeated on some amendments to its legislation. If something hasn't been set out in, in great detail in your party manifesto, does the Salisbury Convention still apply or is an opposition party within its rights to, to vote it down? 
the Salisbury Medicine Convention absolutely applies to what a government intends to deliver and has a mandate to deliver. No government sets out in explicit detail in its manifesto how it's going to implement the things that it sets out to deliver and, uh, and it would be wrong for any opposition party to think that the Salisbury Addison Convention doesn't apply just because they don't like what it is that the government with a mandate is trying to achieve. Labour's Baroness Smith again. We expect the government to show its intent and the manifesto commitment, the promise made to the electorate, has to show intent. If the government hasn't shown what it intends to do, we need to look at that. The other pivotal group in the Lords are the 179 independent crossbench peers. The government must win them over if Labour and the Lib Dems choose to vote against its legislation. There are few among the crossbenchers who know as much about how Parliament operates as one of the newest members, Lord Liz Vane, who, as Sir Robert Rogers, was the clerk of the House of Commons. I think given the arithmetic in this Parliament, it'll be very important for the, uh, the Lords to balance their role of uh, expert scrutiny and of course there are a lot of things where we're coming forward where the Lords has a powerful interest and expertise, uh, human rights and constitutional affairs to name but two, where it feels that its voice should be heard. Now the Labour Lib Dem alliance can, if they combine, they can substantially outgun the Conservative government in the Lords. So I think the House of Lords will need to be cautious and ensure that criticism and opposition are well argued and justified, not the flexing of muscles simply because they're there. Even at this early stage in the Parliament, there are signs that Labour and the Lib Dems plan to make life difficult for the government in the Lords. It's been defeated ten times there already since the election, such as on votes at 16. Lord Wallace again. I mean, the issues in which we voted on this week were ones which we thought were important. Votes for 16 and 17-year-olds in council elections, we do believe uh, is important. That will now go to the House of Commons, and the House of Commons will have to take a view on it. But we just don't do it for the, for the sheer fun or the hell of it. You know, each of these amendments that we voted on and defeated the government, they, they, there was a point to them. However, Baroness Stoll doesn't agree. It's another matter altogether when the House of Lords starts to initiate its own agenda and opposition parties start to defeat the government by bringing into legislation an agenda that they had not been successful with at the last election. So are are you example, thinking sp specifically about votes at 16? Votes at 16 is a good example. That is something which this House decided to introduce into a bill on devolution to cities. Is that actually what the House of Lords is all about? Should it be a place for opposition parties who have been severely defeated at the general election to continue to pursue their own agenda? The opposition parties in the House of Lords are opposition parties and they should not be using their numbers in this House to defeat the government in a way which would prevent the government from delivering on its manifesto commitments. That would not be consistent with the democracy that we live in. The Prime Minister is expected to appoint a large number of new Conservative peers soon, but that won't change the fact that the government is outnumbered. Labour's Baroness Smith says the government has to persuade peers of its arguments. We see it with different ministers and different bills. There are some ministers who will want to engage, they'll have discussions outside the chamber as well. When you raise an issue with them, they'll want to talk about it. There are others who put their heads down and read the brief they've got from the civil servants. That's when there's problems. So if I was the leader of the House, I'd be saying to my ministers, talk to the opposition. If they've got something that's worth considering, consider it. Even if you reject it, but consider. The Lib Dem Lord Wallace. We're not just going to roll over, and I think the leader of the House and the government whips well know that. If there are occasions in this particular piece of legislation where we think the government has got it right, we'll support the government. And I think in that way it creates a good atmosphere, but it also means that legislation that leaves the House of Lords is all the better for it. The Conservative Baroness Stowell again. We always want to listen to the arguments that people put forward and where we think that it is right that an argument that is put forward would help improve our legislation, then we will 
want to take on board the arguments that have been made. We want our bills to deliver on our election promises. We want the people of this country to get what they have voted for. And if in the process of debating our legislation, the House of Lords is able to help us improve our legislation so we deliver on those manifesto commitments, that is great. But what the House of Lords does not exist to do is to get in the way of what the people of this country have voted for. That's the leader of the House of Lords, Baroness Stoll, ending that report by Gary Connor. That's it from me, Carolyn Quinn, for this week.